Today we're going to be talking about taking range of motion for the lumbosacral spine. Uh, specifically, we're going to be looking at flexion extension, rotation, and side bend, as well as two component motions, otherwise known as repeated motions, and quadrant testing. So let's go ahead and dive right in. When you have your patient in the clinic begin to perform these, one of the things that can be helpful for reproducing from your initial evaluation or initial assessment to your reassessment or reevaluation is to standardize it. Now, uh, one of the ways in which you can do this is by ensuring that their positioning or their setup is identical from one to the next and so forth. So how we're gonna get started today is we're gonna ask our patient here to turn 90 degrees and face this direction. And then one of the things that I find helpful is to standardize their foot position. And so what we can do here is actually place our foot between their heels, ask them to bring their heels together on our foot. Perfect. And then we slide our shoe out of the way. That ensures that each time we're able to reproduce this exact setup position. Okay. So then from here, we're ready to go ahead and get started. Now, initially, what we're going to do is just kind of screen the movement. And so we're going to ask the individual to keep their knees straight, but not locked. And so sometimes we can ask them to kind of shake out their knees a little bit. And then we're going to ask them to bend over as if they were going to touch their toes. And so we'll allow our patient to do that. And we can see that this is about how much range of motion he gets. Now, in later videos, we're going to talk about the difference between lumbar versus pelvic or sacral uh, flexion um, and how that degree of rotation through the pelvis can affect things. But for now, we're just looking at global range of motion. All right. And then we can allow our patient to come back up. OK, so that gives us a global assessment. Now, certainly we can also take a measurement of that. And there's a couple different ways that we can do that. One is to have handy a tape measure. And so if our patient were to again bend forward, we could have our tape measure ready. We can take a measurement from zero up to the middle fingertip. And that would be our measurement in this case it's 15.2 centimeters. That's option one. It's always taken from the ground to the fingertip. Option two is to actually use a goniometer. Now, Mike Raymond in his text uh, advocates for the following assessment technique. We're gonna have our individual flex forward. The opposite would be true for extension, just going back. But aligning your stationary arm with midline of the femur, the greater, greater trochanter is your axis of rotation. And then your mobile arm is going to line up with the costal angle. So in this case, go ahead and relax. We have about 74 degrees of lumbosacral flexion, right? Again, the same can be done for extension as well. So those are a couple ways in which you can grab that objective measure as you come forward into flexion. Now, extension is going to be just the opposite. The patient's going to adopt a hands-on hip position. Oftentimes, we want to come around the back to ensure that they're not overextending or losing their balance, as well as to stabilize here. And so we'll ask our patient to go ahead and extend back as far as they can. Good. And then to have them come back into that upright position. Now, with extension, it's much harder to grab that tape measure and utilize that while also guarding your patient. Goniometry is certainly an option. Additionally, inclinometry is an option here where you're using your bubble inclinometers. Um, but most of the time, we're just going to look to see if they can actually get into extension as well as the degree to which symptoms are exacerbated or brought on, looking for that concordant sign. Now, with this, we're really looking at the sagittal plane and two additional movements that we want to look at before we move on with other kind of multi-planar assessment is repeated motions. Repeated motions is an idea that's really uh, uh, proposed and advocated for uh, by McKenzie-based therapists looking at the way in which successive movements either alleviate or exacerbate the signs and symptoms. And there's a bit of debate whether it's five repetitions or 10 repetitions. Somewhere in there is probably appropriate as you're looking at the aggravating factors. For time, I oftentimes will default to five repetitions. And so what they would be is having the individual move both into flexion or extension repetitiously. So it would look like this. Same starting position, 
In this case, we're gonna have you reach forward as if to touch your toes and then come back up a total of five times when you're ready. Now, as the individual is doing this, one of the other questions that we're asking is if symptoms get better, worse, or no different with each successive repetition. And relax. So after that fifth repetition is completed, again, we're looking if symptoms get worse or better. The other thing we want to keep in mind is whether or not those symptoms are centralizing or peripheralizing. Centralizing would mean that they are coming back towards the center or back towards the spine. Peripheralizing would mean that they are radiating out into one or both of the lower extremities into the feet. One thing to note, oftentimes as those symptoms come back into that central location, the intensity of the symptoms will get worse. That means that they may have a three or a four out of 10 on a visual analog scale or a numerical pain rating scale, but as the symptoms centralize, it actually magnifies the intensity, so it may go up to a five or six. It still counts though as centralization if it's moving from the periphery back to a more central location. Again, that repetitious fashion can be done going into extension as well for five times, hands on hips, and then we're gonna have our patient come into extension five times. The same protocol exists here. We're looking for better, worse, no different. You can also watch in some of those different planes to ensure that the movement is uh, moving symmetrically, that they're not trying to get out of a specific position, and that it looks fluid. You may also notice, as is the case with these motions, that with each additional repetition, a little bit more range of motion is gained. Those are helpful cues to let you know whether or not this individual is dealing with more mechanical irritation or more neurologic irritation. Now, once we're done with our sagittal plane motion of flexion extension, we're ready to look at some of our other planes. And so with this, we can look at side bending and rotation. With rotation, we'll stay in this position, relax the arms to the side, and we want to ensure that the hips and the pelvis are not moving a whole lot. That is one way in which to look at this. We're going to be a little bit more narrow in our focus, and so we're going to hang on kind of right at the greater trochanters, and have our individual give themselves a hug across the shoulders, and then ask them to rotate to the right as far as they can. Good, and then to the left as far as they can. Excellent, and relax. That can also be done in a seated position where the individual is sitting down. That helps to stabilize the pelvis. And then coming from an axial direction looking down, you can take the range of motion really through the clavicles and this would be then defined as thoracolumbar rotation. The last measurement then that we want to look at is side bending. And so we're going to have our individual turn back and face the camera here. All right. And with side bending, what we're looking for is not necessarily how far they can go by lifting the opposing or kind of contralateral leg, but with both feet in contact with the ground, how far they can bend over. And so with this, Again, we can use a goniometer from the back. Um, I tend to rely a little bit more heavily on the tape measure for standardization, and it really doesn't matter from where you take the motion. Just be consistent such that your intra-rater reliability is high. So you can either take it from the floor to the fingertips, you can take it from midline of the knee, you can take it from the lateral malleoli. So it's up to you in terms of what's kind of your uh, specific measurement location. Just be consistent. So, we're going to have them go to the right first, reach over as far as you can, and then from there we would take our tape measure and measure to the tip of the middle finger. We're going to replicate that then to the left side, and again we would take our measurement there. Now one thing to note, with these straight side-to-side -side motions, if we begin to see any rotation along with that side bending, that clues us in that there may be some kind of a mechanical irritation within the lumbosacral spine that is not allowing the individual to move in a straight planar fashion. 
If that were to occur, we have one more tool kind of in our arsenal that we can use to further assess, and that is what's known as a quadrant assessment. Now, a quadrant assessment really looks at the totality of an axial view of the spine and breaks it into four equal quadrants. What that would then be is more flexion biased and more extension biased. And so for this, we're going to have our patient go through each one of these quadrants. Initially, we're going to have them rotate and reach down the front of the opposite leg. So it's rotation and flexion as far as they can when you're ready. And so we not only have rotation, but then also flexion and slight side bending. Good, we're going to come up. They're then going to rotate to the opposite side and reach down the front of their leg. Excellent, and come back up. And so that gives us our first two quadrants, essentially from 12 o'clock to 3 and from 12 o'clock to 9. We need our extension quadrant, so we're going to have our individual take one step forward, perfect. And now with this, they're going to take that hand, wrap it around to their hamstrings back of the leg, and in doing so, that also is going to rotate them, and then reach down as far as you can to the back, Excellent, and then reach down as far as you can to the opposite side. Excellent. Now with all of these movements, recognize we can also add a little bit of overpressure if we suspect that that is re reproducing the concordant sign and we want to be sure about it. So as an example, if going back into that quadrant position to the left uh, was causing or reproducing the pain, go ahead and uh, do that for us. We can come in and kind of stabilize here and just give a little bit of overpressure to ensure that we're getting kind of what we think we should be getting uh, into flexion if they're reaching forward to touch their toes, right? We can come in and kind of stabilize right on the sacrum and then give them a little bit of overpressure into flexion. These can also be done in a seated position. Any of the overpressures, though, should be handled or approached with care, recognizing that you're likely going to exacerbate symptoms. And so if you have any suspicion that the individual may lose their balance or may be a safety risk, always default by placing your patient uh, in that seated position for safety. So have a go with lumbosacral range of motion assessment, both actively as well as with some of the overpressures and the combined motions or quadrant tests. And let me know if there's any questions.